right guys, today we are in Darwin, Australia, getting ready to visit Crocosaurus Cove. Crocosaurus Cove is actually a place I've been following on Instagram for a number of years. I've always wanted to come here and get into this giant cylinder where you're in the water with the crocodile. The most feared animal in all of Australia is without question, the saltwater crocodile. Yet fear often comes as a result of that which we don't understand. Since 2008, Crocosaurus Cove has been on a mission to educate the public by easing the bad reputation these prehistoric reptiles carry. It seems extreme, but sometimes the best way to face your fears is to get face to face with them. And while they proudly display a large collection of Australian reptiles, they are famous for their main attraction, the cage of death. All right, so the guys are getting ready to be the first ones into the tube. It's, uh, it's a little different. <laughs> Haven't done this before. I'm gonna actually be filming from outside behind the glass to get shots of them underwater. Then I will get inside of the tube and get my own shot at getting some epic B-roll. What is this called again? Cage of Death. Oh, Mario. Yeah. We're about to get in the Cage of Death. Nice. You're already in, actually. All right, yeah. here we go. It's going to be a tight squeeze, huh? That's not too, not too bad, actually. Oh, we're being lowered. Oh, we're getting lifted up. We're actually not lowering. Wasn't expecting that. Oh, this is sturdy. I see a croc. All right, we're officially being lowered into the water. Here goes nothing in the cage of death. Going in. This is a little, little intimidating, I will say. Yeah, all that's separating us and the croc is the cage of death. The cage of death is an impenetrable plexiglass tube. At nearly three inches thick, it gives those who are brave enough the chance to enter the water for an unforgettable 360 degree view of the crocodiles. The saltwater crocodile dominates its environment, packing one of the most powerful bite forces on the planet, yet it's their stealth and speed that make them so dangerous. Oh, oh, oh man, did you feel that? Just totally thumped the death cage. That's a powerful animal, you can tell right there. That was crazy. In their natural environment, they are often concealed in murky brackish waters. So seeing them in this fashion, crystal clear water, is pretty unheard of. And it's an experience you can't have anywhere else in the world. <laughs> He's still behind you, are you? <laughs> how the guy's dive was. Tough to get shots from underneath there, but man, I bet they got some good stuff on that GoPro. I'd do that again. Would you come back to this? Yeah, that was neat. Yeah. You get right up close to these prehistoric predators. I mean, they're huge. You really don't know how big they are until you're like right in their face, in their grill. Yeah. Big teeth. <laughs> and then you can feel the boom. Like, I can't even come yeah. close to the pounding that they Oh man, this is at least like three inches thick. Yeah. Alright guys, what do we reckon? Was it good? It was awesome! Loved it! Awesome! Loved right, it! Out. We're gonna pop that ladder straight through the middle. Okay. Okay. Climb on out. Hey! How was it? It's cool, man. That's a that's a big crocodile. Well, we survived the cage of death, and now it's your turn. How are your shots? That's the real question. Believe it or not, yeah. once you go underwater, it's clear. Yeah, there, there's definitely spots where there aren't as many teeth marks. Yeah. You gotta try to 
find those spots. But there's a really cool like reflection that happens. Like when you're underwater, it almost looks like there's two crocs. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Yeah. All right, guys, I'm about to get in the water with a massive saltwater crocodile. This is going to be epic. All right, so Mario and I survived the cage of death. Now we have bigger cameras and it's Coyote's turn. You ready, dude? Going into the cage of death. Now, in most instances, I probably try to get into this water without a cage, but that would turn into the bite episode that would be the last bite episode we ever did on the channel. So it's actually a little nerve wracking once you start getting into the cage itself. Okay, I am inside the cage. Now what's happening right now is they're slowly lowering me into the water and you can see the huge saltwater crocodile right there. Getting into the water with one in the wild, absolutely impossible. So this is the best way to do it. Crocosaurus Cove, one of the coolest experiences you can have with any animal, let alone one of the most dominant reptilian predators in the world. Arguably the most dangerous non-venomous reptile that exists on our planet. I guess this is the moment where they just let you hang above the crocodile. I am literally hovering just over it. Alright, we're going down. Here we go. The crocs who call the cove home were removed from the wild because they were considered nuisance animals. That means they were in an area where they could interact with humans. As an alternative to these crocodiles being destroyed, they were brought here, where they now serve as educational ambassadors for their species. Entering the Cage of Death was definitely an experience I've wanted to have since finding Crocosaurus Cove on Instagram. And now that I have been in the cage myself, I can promise you, it's an encounter you will never forget. If you ever find yourself in Darwin, Australia, make sure to book your dive in advance by visiting their website. Or if you just like amazing pictures of crocodiles, make sure to follow them on Instagram. Over the course of my life, I have successfully caught and released over 500 snapping turtles. And my goal with each and every encounter is not to be bitten. These turtles are incredibly powerful and their razor sharp jaws are capable of cutting through human flesh like a hot knife through butter. It's fair to say that I have had some close calls. I have also taken some intentional bites to show you just how bad a bite can truly be. Ah! Ah! Oh! Ah! Ah! Oh, he's ripping 
this out of my hand. Oh my gosh. And as we are all aware, ah! there have also been some pretty painful and gruesome unintentional bites. No matter how careful you are or how experienced you may be, accidents in the heat of action do occasionally happen. Get ready to witness the worst snapping turtle bite I have ever taken. Oh, if you are squeamish, I will warn you now, there will be blood. Okay, got another turtle bite around me. Okay, um, trying not to get bitten by another turtle. I got a turtle underneath me right now. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Huge turtle underneath my foot, huge turtle in hand. Okay, this is definitely, definitely a dangerous scenario right here. Well, it is another beautifully sunny day here in Columbus, Ohio, and we are out searching for snapping turtles. I'm back at Black Lick Woods, Ashton Pond, where some of the largest turtles in the state currently reside. You guys know the turtle I'm looking for. Maybe you remember a little episode where I caught Stumpbeak. This is where he lives, and right now I've been scouting with the binoculars and have seen several turtles moving about. Some on the back side of the pond and some over here. Which one of them is Stumpbeak? I'm not sure yet, but with any luck, we're gonna catch him and weigh him again and see if he is crested close to 60 pounds in weight. Now this is gonna be a very difficult scenario for me because I'm gonna to have to go out on the kayak and be extremely stealthy. These turtles are very much in tune with their environment and the second that they hear somebody trudging through, they immediately dive down into the murky abyss. So, me walking along the edges of this pond, not possible. Me in a kayak sneaking up in stealth mode, with any luck, we're gonna land ourselves a giant. Black Lake Woods is home to some very large dragons, including the infamous Stumpbeak. I was originally introduced to this turtle by wildlife photographer Carl Hassel, who captured photographic evidence of this giant reptile several years ago. During the first season of Dragon Tales, I managed to land the beast, and he tipped the scales at 54 pounds. So I'm curious to learn how much he has grown in three years. There he is. Right back there underneath that log, I see Stumpy. He is actually moving into the shallows, likely claiming dominance of that territory. And again, right now it's breeding season, guys, so these snapping turtles are duking it out, dragon power, fighting each other for the rights to breeding territory. And the giant has just moved back into that corner. Okay, let's get in the kayak. I gotta catch him now. If I could land this behemoth for a second time, there was a chance he could become the living world record for a wild-caught common snapping turtle. The record currently hails at 76.5 pounds and dates back to the year 1988. Could this turtle, who we all know as Stumpbeak, have gained 23 pounds in three years? Look at how massive this turtle is. Only a successful catch would tell. I'm halfway through the pond right now. I could just see the carapace breached on the other side of that log. Okay, we're gonna sneak in real quiet here. Okay, hasn't heard me yet. Guys, this could be Stumpy. There he is! There he is! Big turtle, big turtle, big turtle! Nice! Okay, got another turtle right around me. Trying not to get bitten by another turtle. I got a turtle underneath me right now. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Huge turtle underneath my foot, huge turtle in hand. Okay, this is definitely, definitely a dangerous scenario right here. Got him! I see that. Or one, and there goes my boat. Not good. I have another huge turtle underneath my foot as well. Double dragon scenario here, part two. Hold on. Took a bite, took a bite. Bad bite. Wrong end of the turtle, hold on. All right, gonna need some assistance. We'll go around. Ah. Shoot, I really wanna get this turtle too. All right, I'm abandoning that turtle and we're going in towards shore. You gotta know when 
You've gone far enough. Okay. You are right. <clears throat> wow. That is a giant right there. Man, I got a lot of blood coming out of my hand right now. Turtle took off the top of my finger. Most dangerous thing you can ever do is reach your finger down into the water after a turtle. All right, this is gonna need some first aid. We're gonna bring this turtle around and get him up close. <sighs> we got ourselves oh, a giant right? here. Yeah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. That's a big turtle. Unfortunately, it is not Stumpy. It's just another one of the giants that lives here at Ashton Pond. Oh boy. It may have been Stumpy underwater. I reached down, tried to get myself into a double dragon scenario, and it took the top of my finger off. As you can see, it is just the tip hanging on. Okay, let's get up there, let's get my finger wrapped, and let's get the rest of this scene. Woo! Man, I lost my boat. Woo. Well, I literally jumped into the middle of a snapping turtle fight. Two giants battling it out. I didn't realize there were two there until I was up on top of the log and jumped in, and this was the first one I could grab. And I thought, okay, well, I gotta get this turtle at least away from my leg. So I reached down, hoping to feel for the top of the carapace, and unfortunately, my finger went down just off the side. It turned its head and got my whole finger in its mouth. Uh, it's probably worse than it looks, or maybe not as bad as it looks. I don't know which, but when I looked at it, when it initially came up, the whole side of my finger is chomped off. You can see the blood coagulating there. And this is exactly why we need to respect snapping turtles from a safe distance, guys. Well, before I weigh the turtle, first I have to tend to my finger. I'm gonna actually cover him up. And to do that, I'm gonna get this turtle weigh bag wet, just to keep him nice and cool. Here in the sun, he will be fine, but this will also keep him calm and locked in position. You see that? Turtle under bag, he's gonna stay put. Okay, I'm gonna apply first aid to my own finger. And what I have here is a bottle of water, some gauze, a compression bandage, band-aid, and a simple pocket knife. What I wanna do is just temporarily get pressure on this, stop the bleeding so that we can finish the presentation and get the weight of this turtle. Like I said, I have not caught this turtle before, so getting its weight is very important. All right, makeshift blood clot right there. And now we can continue on with the presentation of this scene. And I think this is probably a very good point in time to note that snapping turtles, even for somebody like me who is a professional and who's handled hundreds of these turtles, can occasionally get a bite on you. And I'm very lucky that the turtle did not hold onto my finger or get more of it than it did. A few stitches will fix that right up. But right now, let's take a look at this giant. Oh, hey buddy. Oh, now he's got the turtle way bag in his mouth. We need that back. Come on, here, pick him up. There we go, hi buddy. Look at you. That is about as perfect as it gets for a common snapping turtle specimen. Now this is not stumpy, but it is very similar in design. The carapace, which as we know is the top of the shell, looks almost identical to stump beak's shell. Now when I went back there, there was another turtle and it may have been stump beak that bit my finger, but this one is equally as handsome looking and certainly as healthy. This is not a 60 pound turtle, but I'm guessing it is probably somewhere close to 50. And like I said, this is a turtle that we do not yet have on record here. But let's take a look at this creature's tail. Let me turn it around for you here like this. Can you see it? Yep. Go ahead and zoom in there. A true dragon tail on this reptile. Let's see if I can bend it down a little bit for you there. Wow, quite the beast. I'll tell you what, it's a lot harder to handle a turtle too when you're missing the tip of your finger and I'm trying to be really, really careful right now so that I am not bitten a second time. But look at those front limbs. He is massive. Huge claws, all in perfect condition. Perfect beak, eyes fully intact. You guys wanna see what his plaster on looks like? Yeah, let me lift it up for you. See just how healthy this turtle is. Look at its underside there. That is an absolute giant. And as we know, turtles and their relatives have been on the planet for over 200 million years, and you can certainly see the prehistoric nature in this creature. Hi, buddy. I know you would love to get my nose in your mouth. We're gonna try to avoid that today, okay? All right, next thing I wanna do is get the weight of this turtle so we officially have it on record. And to do that, I'm going to set him down very gently here. Hold on just a second there, buddy. Okay, I do have 
my trusty turtle scale with me. Now this goes up to 50 pounds in weight. I do not believe that this turtle is over 50 pounds, but I am guessing that he is close. You see that? If we hit 50 pounds, it's considered a true swamp monster. I also have my turtle way bag here with me. And to do this, uh -uh, you stay. Sometimes they listen to me. Okay, I'm gonna gently place him down inside of the bag and we're gonna hoist him up. This is gonna cause no harm to the turtle whatsoever. And actually inside the bag, he will be a little more calm. Just like crocodilians, when you keep their eyes covered, don't you bite the bag. Watch your fingers. They oftentimes stay calm. And this is tricky because once he's in the bag, then of course you don't know where the head is and things can get dangerous. Okay, turtle is in the bag. Head is right there. Now he can still bite through the bag, so we have to be extremely careful. I'm gonna bring the turtle up, and then I'm gonna get the position of the weight. Are you good? One, two, three. Is it maxing it? No. Oh. Okay, right there. 34 pounds is what he clocks in at. I knew he was under 50, but that is still a really, really good sized snapping turtle. All right, now the tricky part, getting him back out of the bag. Okay, the head's on that side. All right, come on, buddy. Out you go. All right. Oh, I know. Don't bite the bag, don't bite the bag. Okay, whoa, what a big boy. There he is. Whew. Tell you what, even at 34 pounds, that is a lot to handle right there. So what are you gonna name him? Well, since it's a new catch, I think we should call him Big Chomper. How about that? Yeah. Awesome. Remember guys, we're still looking for that world record size snapping turtle. So right in the comments section below, send us pictures on social media. I hear you hissing. Show us the pictures of the turtles you've seen. And if it looks like something that could be a world record, we may show up in your city, in your backyard, in your pond to try to land a world record snapping turtle. All right, time to get him back into the water and get me to the hospital to get this finger sewn up. So what did we learn? Well, for starters, I didn't catch Stumpy. So that means it's still a mystery as to whether or not he has grown to world record proportions. I also learned what happens when you blindly reach your hand into the water after a snapping turtle. Ouch. But I got lucky once again, and hopefully my mishap was a clear warning that snapping turtles have the potential to be incredibly dangerous. Truth be told, I never went to the hospital, but instead cleaned the bite thoroughly and kept a close eye on it to make sure that infection did not set in. This was certainly one painful mistake, but in the end, I love turtles, even if they do occasionally try to bite my fingers off. With the setting of the hot Florida sun comes the rise of its nocturnal predators. Some of these creatures, like the American alligator, are not the kind of foe you would ever want to stumble upon while out exploring in the Everglades. And despite the fact that alligators rarely attack humans, their natural instinct is to hunt under the cover of darkness. All the more reason to steer clear of their environments at night. On this humid evening, we are back en route towards civilization after filming a selection of sunset B-roll shots. Traveling the back roads at night, believe it or not, is actually a great place to stumble upon a variety of snake species that slither up from the swampy waters and onto the asphalt to absorb the daytime's remaining heat. Much to our delight, this is exactly the scenario we encountered, and you are now about to witness one of America's most dangerous snakes. Holy cow, okay. I got the GoPro rolling. Yeah, Mario, yeah. get the lights, get the lights. Give me that snake tong. We have got a huge water moccasin. Here, here, here. Give me this, give me this. Here. It is right in the middle of the road. Go slow, go slow. Mark, kill the car. Keep the lights on though. Wow. Holy cow. That is the biggest water moccasin I have ever seen. Wow. Look at that snake. That thing is huge. All right, we're gonna wait until we've got the lights out massive water moccasin just in front of us here. 
You can't tell how big it is on the GoPro, but it is massive. That is a huge water moccasin. Oh, 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 he's starting to move. He's curling into a tighter ball. I'm gonna try to come on this side of it. That's exactly what we want right there. You see how it's curling up into a tight little ball? Perfect defensive pose right there. Wow, that is a massive snake. That's the water moccasin for you right there. The quintessential cotton mouth. I'm definitely gonna keep my snake tongs in between me and the snake. These snakes are capable of striking up to three feet in length. It will lunge its entire body forward. You can see it's puffing itself up right now, trying to be bigger, saying, I'm a big snake. Yes, we are aware that you are a big snake. In fact, this is the largest water moccasin I have ever seen. Mario, go ahead and zoom in on the back of his tail there. See that little wiggling of the tail? Mimicking the movements of a rattlesnake, trying to warm me back up. I am agitated. You can see he's puffing up his body now. Woo! Woo! Did you see that? Yeah. I barely even moved, brought the snake tongs back, and it struck at me. Look at the position that his head is in right now. Okay, I'm gonna do this. I just wanna test the distance of his strike here. So he's gonna strike again. Okay. He's got his back to you, Mark, which is good for you, not necessarily good for me. Oh, you see that? Another strike. Okay, I've kind of tested his limits. He's still got an okay shot there? Yeah. Wow. Look at how heavy body this snake is. There's no way you would mistake a water moccasin of this size for just a normal water snake. And oftentimes those two species are confused for each other. As you guys know, we've done an episode in the past, where we've compared the water moccasin to the water snake. And at that point, we compared two snakes that are of similar size. This thing is an absolute giant. One way to easily identify a moccasin when it's fully adult like this, look at the banding right on the side of the face. Mario, see if you can zoom in on that there. Oh, wow, just bit the tongs, did you see that? Okay, completely spun its body around. Go ahead and zoom in there, get a good shot. Let me get on my feet, he's a little closer than I'd yep. be when laying on the ground. There. Now, if the snake does decide to take off, Mario, Mark, you both just get up and I'll, I'll get a hold of it with the tongs or, or get in front of it. There you go, now you can get a better idea of just how long this snake is. I'd say it's close to three and a half feet in length. Ooh, an incredibly dangerous snake. Now when I say this moccasin is big, it's almost an understatement. I wanna give you guys something for scale. What I'm gonna do is actually move the GoPro with the snake tongs in close to the snake. Oh, she struck right out at the camera. I guess he doesn't like GoPros. So you can have something in there for scale. Can you see that? Oh yeah. So that's a GoPro next to the head of that snake. The snake's head is almost as large as the GoPro is. When it comes to the girth of its body, I would say in circumference, it's probably close to six or seven inches and the length of the snake is around three to three and a half feet. This is without question the largest water moccasin I've ever seen. Now, as we know, the water moccasin has a very popular nickname, the cotton mouth. What they'll oftentimes do is curl up in a tight ball and then bend their head back and gape their mouth open. The inside of the mouth is bright white, just like a cotton ball. And as we know, that bright white coloration is aposematic, warning any predator that this bright color means that I am potentially toxic. Now, when you're talking copperheads versus water moccasins versus rattlesnakes, I would say that the water moccasin is pretty much right there in the middle when it comes to toxicity. Armed with a hemotoxic venom, and if you were bitten by this snake, there's no question about it, you were going to find yourself on the way to the hospital. All right, Mario, go ahead and zoom in on the snake's head. See how he's got his head positioned up like that and has a very triangular shape to it. Almost looks like the spade of a shovel, the front of a shovel. That signifies that this is a venomous snake. I know we featured the snake species on the channel before, but most of those have been small to medium sized. So as we were just driving out of the Everglades here and we saw the snake, we had to stop the vehicle, get the lights out, get the cameras, and get a couple of really cool shots. All right, that's exactly what we want right there. He says, curled himself up into a bit of a tighter ball. Getting... Oh. Oh. Okay, or he's ready to strike and he just completely bit down and wrapped his head around the snake tongs. Look at all Doused of the venom on the tongs. The tongs. Let me get a shot of that real quick. That's crazy. Wow, that's a lot of venom. Yeah. 
Now you may be asking yourself, what is this snake doing in the center of the road like this at night? We actually just finished filming sunset B-roll shots. We're getting ready to drive ourselves out of the Everglades and here's this giant right in the middle of the road. What the snakes will do at night is come out and lay on the asphalt to warm up. Now the water moccasin is primarily a nocturnal species. So what's getting ready to do now is after it heats up, it's gonna head off into this underbrush and it's gonna begin hunting. Now, as a semi-aquatic pit viper, they have a really incredible opportunity to be in the water and hunting for things like fish and amphibians. Now, as compared to the other venomous pit vipers that we have in the United States, like rattlesnakes and copperheads, this is the only one that's actually capable of spending a significant amount of time in the water. Well, at this juncture, I think it's probably best that we gently move the snake off the side of the road so another car doesn't come and accidentally run it over. This is a pristine specimen when it comes to the quintessential water moccasin. How cool is this? Stumbling upon one of the most notorious pit vipers here in the Everglades. All right, buddy, let's move you off the road here. <laughs> Came right at me. All right, there we go. The snake is now safely on the side of the road. He's gonna disappear into the underbrush and continue his night of hunting. See you later, big guy. Of all the venomous snake species in the United States, it is a valid statement to say that the water moccasin is one of the most dangerous. They are quick striking and incredibly defensive if cornered. Their venom is not the most potent, however, when they deliver a bite, it usually comes with a powerful punch and a heavy yield of toxins that will most certainly send you to the hospital. It's important that you never try to catch or harass one of these snakes. And if you see one in the wild, remember that like all slithering reptiles, they simply want to be left alone. And if you walk in the opposite direction, your encounter with a notorious cottonmouth will be a completely safe one. This summer, in the scorching deserts of the Southwest, something strange has happened. Science experts believe it may be a radioactive anomaly. What we have here is a radioactive anomaly. To be honest, no one really knows why normal-sized lizards have now turned into city-destroying monsters. What's going on, Coyote Pack? It's a dark, windy night in Arizona. And this evening, we're going to take a look at two of the coolest lizards in the Southwest, the Gila Monster and the Beaded Lizard, which happen to be the only two venomous lizards in the Western Hemisphere. That's Our right. goal this evening is to take a look at some of the similarities and, of course, some of the differences, and then ultimately, at the end, decide, are you Team Gila? Or are you Team Beaded? Hmm, I don't know now. We'll have to see how this all pans out. Now, Mario, to get started, it's important to note that neither of these animals were found in the wild. That's right. Both the Gila and the Beaded were born and raised in captivity, and they are ambassadors for their species, and we are very excited to have them here hanging out with us tonight for this little educational session in venomous desert lizards. Mm -hmm. Which means these guys are fairly tame, actually. That's why we are able to handle them the way we are, because, of course, they are venomous. Right. Right. Have to be careful, not gonna get our fingers too close to those mouths. You don't wanna take an accidental bite. That would be very painful, but we'll get to some of that in a second. I think where it all begins with these two cool lizards is in the name. It's all in the name, right? So the Gila monster and the beaded lizard both belong to the genus Heloderma, which means studded skin. That's right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my lizard sideways here and all of those little bumps that you see running down the length of each lizard's body are osteoderms. That's right. Little pieces of bone covered in skin and scale, which of course makes them look beaded or armored. Right, and hence the name beaded lizard, right? Mm -hmm. All those little osteoderms look like little tiny beadwork. So the people in the range of these animals saw that and said beaded lizard. Right, and pretty much looks like armor coating. Now, when you look at these two lizards and you realize that they are related and they actually are buddies, they live together in captivity, which is kind of cool. So they're very friendly. You guys don't have to worry about them possibly getting into a fight with one another. There is another really 
interesting and obvious difference between the two of these lizards. Yes. And of course that size. That's right. I mean, look at the size of this beaded lizard compared to the Gila monster. Let's try to turn them sideways real quick so that everybody can just see look at that. that difference. That's significant. Right. Right, now you're used to seeing the Gila monster on some Brave Wilderness episodes, but we've never featured the beaded lizard. And a really cool fact is, even though the beaded lizard is larger, they can get up to three feet in length, so this one has a little bit more growing to do, the Gila monster is technically the largest native species, lizard species, in the United States. Right, and for a Gila monster, this is pretty much considered full grown. They can't yeah. get a little bit bigger than this, but when you think about this as being a full grown Gila and that being nearly a full grown beaded lizard, that is a huge difference. Yeah, I think the beaded gets a very big point in size. I would agree. The beaded lizard, when it comes to size mattering, it might make a difference when it comes to hunting for your prey. Now, one thing you'll also notice is the length of the tail. Oh, yes. The tail has some differences, but also some similarities. Let's try to see if we can get those side by side. Look at that. The tail of the beaded is significantly longer. Mm -hmm. uh, the Gila monster has a little bit more of a short and stout tail. Now, they both serve a similar function and they store fat in their tails. So if you were to give a squeeze mm -hmm. to your Gila's tail, it's not doing to the beaded, right? That's all a fat reserve. So a healthy Gila and beaded lizard will have a nice fat reserve in their tail. Now the reason for them keeping these fat reserves in their tails is that in the desert environment, sometimes if there's a prolonged drought and these lizards need to stay down in their burrows for months at a time, they can survive off of the nutrients that exist within that fat reserve in the tail. Exactly, because both the Gila monster and the beaded lizard live in arid environments. In fact, the beaded lizard is found in Mexico down to Guatemala, whereas the Gila monster overlaps in certain ranges as the beaded lizard, but of course found in parts of the US. Right, and it's important to note that the Gila monster is the only venomous lizard in the United States, and combined together, these are the only two venomous lizards in the Western Hemisphere. That's right, that's Pretty right. Pretty cool. Now, another similarity that these two lizards share, and you can probably notice that forked tongue sticking out back and forth, oh. is of course that tongue structure. Yep, the forked tongue is a extrasensory organ. It's a chemoreceptor. Mm -hmm. So if you were to look at the eyes of the Gila and the beaded, are they big? No, they're pretty small. Pretty tiny, yeah, they don't have good vision. So they actually rely on their forked tongue, their excellent sense of hearing, and sense of smell to detect prey and predators. And that leads to a very good question. What do Gila monsters and beaded eat? Well, it's important to note that they're very slow moving, so they're right. not exactly gonna chase down a jackrabbit or a roadrunner. Check this out, check this out, ready? That's about top speed. Yeah. <laughs> they're not fast. Slow moving, it's like <laughs> a tortoise for the most part. Which means they're opportunistic. The mm -hmm. easier the meal that they can consume, the better it's going to be for the lizard. So they're famous for being able to rob bird nests of their eggs or right. their young. Where else might you find young animals? Right, so they're, they're nest specialists. Now one thing to consider is ground nesting birds, right? Mm. They're not going up into the trees and raiding a nest, although the beaded are semi-arboreal, so sometimes they do, but primarily stuff that's on the ground, like little rodents and such that are gonna make their nest in burrows. They'll go in there and they'll actually raid the nest. So when you think about the fact that these guys are opportunistic and they'll take the easiest meal possible, mm -hmm. they're venomous. How is that venom necessarily working to consume their prey if they don't have to slow something down like the bite of a rattlesnake? Great question, right? Most snakes will utilize their venom to dispatch their prey items, but it is believed that Gila monsters and beaded lizards use their venom primarily as defense, right? So because they're slow moving, they're subject to predation themselves from coyotes, bobcats and such, so they have to defend themselves with that venom. Right, and it's very important to note that the venom glands in both the Gila monster and the beaded lizard are in the lower jaw. It's not like a rattlesnake that's got a venom gland up on the roof of its mm -hmm. head with hinged fangs. These guys have fixed teeth. They're very sharp, turned backwards, and when this animal bites and grabs onto something, it essentially has to chew in the venom, which works up through its teeth, grooves in the teeth, and then mixes into the saliva. Now, given the fact that both of these lizards are venomous, I'm sure one burning question you all have is which bite is more painful, the Gila monster or the beaded lizard? 
Well, you've experienced the Gila Monster Bite, so do you want to explain a little bit of how that felt? Sure, yeah, the Gila Monster Bite, which was an accidental bite, I must add, was one of the most painful and excruciating experiences I have ever been through. My finger was in the mouth of the Gila Monster for probably less than a second, and still I was envenomated, and the pain lasts for nearly eight hours. So when it comes to the venom compounds, the makeup of that venom, Mario, which venom would you say is more potent? Well, I'm not gonna get bitten by the beaded, so. Good, we're not doing any bites in no. this episode. So I'm not gonna necessarily compare side by side, but they're both in the same genus, Hiloderma, which means that their venom components are gonna be practically identical. But because of the size of the beaded, I think it might deliver more venom and the mechanical bite itself might be stronger. Okay, so we're going to give the beaded lizard the point for the more impactful and possibly painful bite based yes. on size and venom yield. I think so, I think so. And I have to give you guys the warning. If you see one of these lizards in the wild, whether it's a Gila monster or a beaded lizard, admire it from a safe distance. I learned the hard way. They may look slow, but if they need to move quickly, trust me, they can spin their bodies around in the blink of an eye. And if you get your finger, your toe, your hand, anything stuck in the jaws of this lizard, it is going to be a very painful experience. And it's also important to note that these animals are extremely rare and they are a protected species. You cannot handle, harass, kill a Gila monster or beat it in any part of their range because they are protected species. So the chances of encountering a Gila monster or a beaded lizard are rare. And if you do, celebrate it, right? Take a picture from a safe distance, leave it alone, and you're fine. Now, given the fact that these lizards are slow moving and monstrous in their own right, I could only imagine what would it be like if we were capable of shrinking down to the size of a prey item and to be in the environment, running through the Southwest, getting chased by a Gila monster or a beaded lizard. Huh. I wonder what that would be like. This summer, in the scorching deserts of the Southwest, something strange has happened. Science experts believe it may be a radioactive anomaly. What we have here is a radioactive anomaly. A few credible sources point a finger at Mars, and some even think aliens are to blame. To be honest, no one really knows why normal-sized lizards have now turned into city-destroying monsters. In an attempt to find the answers, two fearless adventure-seeking men will embark upon the journey of a lifetime. Step on it, coyote! Come here, coyote. for that rock! Get ready to run. Whoa, that would be crazy. Yeah, tell me about it. And there you have it. We've learned some pretty cool things about the Gila monster and the beaded lizard. Some similarities and some differences. The only two venomous lizards in the Western Hemisphere. Now it's up to you to decide. Which are you, Team Gila? or team beat it. Write in the comment section below and tell us which one of these lizards is your favorite. Today we're filming an episode that features one of the most dangerous snakes in all of South Africa, the Mozambique spitting cobra. This reptile is primarily armed with a cytotoxic venom and a bite becomes an immediate medical emergency. And the crew and I are going to participate in a training drill that will prepare us if the worst case scenario happens. Are you ready? Let's go. All right, time to reveal the snake. There it is, okay. And, ah, bite! Mike, I got bit! Coyote freeze, back ah. up, back up, back up. Tyrone, can you just ah. that snake? Hold still, hold still, okay. Snake secured. Snake secured, good. Mario, can you grab me that chair, please, and ah. place it next to the pool table? Sit down. All right, ah. let's get this shirt off real quick. The whole shirt? Just the side, if, okay. if anything. It's fine. Ah. Calm down, just need you to stay calm. 
Okay, hold still. Oh, it's gotta be that tight. Yep, we gotta keep these things nice and tight. You see, you're gonna see the perfect squares as they come through. Okay. I'm gonna pull my gloves real quick. Oh, all right. Should I elevate my arm at all or anything? Nope, keep it lower than your heart. Okay. All right, let's get you up nice and slow. Fingers tight Keep real them quick. together. Yep. Wow. Okay, let's keep this low, okay? Keep this low. Let's go ahead and get a move on this. We're gonna roll out, guys. Anton's already called the local hospital, and he's got the antivenin to pass into us so we can get it to uh, the doctor as soon as possible here as well. Oh my God. Hey, just hang on there, dude. Hang on, it's gonna be fine. Whee! And that is about as fast as you would need to move if that worst case scenario presents itself. If you are bitten by something like a Mozambique spitting cobra, you literally have minutes to get yourself into a vehicle and on your way to an emergency center. That was intense. Okay, now let's go film with the Mozambique spitting cobra. The KwaZulu-Natal region of South Africa is well known for its high density of reptiles. And today, we will be getting dangerously close with the Mozambique spitting cobra. This is one of the world's most advanced venomous snakes, and they're capable of doing this. Accurately spitting potent venom from a pair of modified front fangs. This venom is used as a defense, often aimed at the eyes of a would-be attacker, which in turn would give the snake a chance to escape the imposing threat. Assisting with this extreme experiment is reptile specialist Tyrone Ping. He's here to help safely wrangle the snake if things get out of control. I'm sure we are all curious to see how accurate the aim of this snake really is. And the only way to find out is to let one of these deadly reptiles spit directly at my face. All right, we are set. The Mozambique spitting cobra is right here underneath this blue bucket. Now, a lot of this might happen really quickly. These reptiles are incredibly accurate with their spitting ability. Let's see if we can catch it in slow motion. All right, here we go. I'm gonna get into position here. Woo, definitely a little nerve wracking. All right, Tyrone, when you're ready, let's uh, peel back the bucket and see what happens. I'm right here, buddy. Okay, staying calm at the moment. Oh, jeez. Oh, I'm right here, I'm right here. Look at my eyes. Look at my eyes, Cobra. Oh, wow, full shot straight into my face. Holy cow, did you guys see that? Look at the shield is completely coated. What's unique about this cobra is you'd think they would have to be completely reared up and hooding to be able to spit, but they can actually spit from that lower angle, and that's one way that they easily trick any invading predator to think, all right, I'm gonna be able to get in there and get my food but, and ah, the cobra does that. Just like that with the face. And that accuracy is unbelievable. All I have to do is move in close. Ah, and look at that, how quick that is. And that's a little bit less of a stream than I thought, but it seems just like a bunch of mist as you're driving through, let's say, a car wash. And it's like all over. All right, going in for another spritz. The Mozambique spitting cobra is actually one of the smaller cobra species here in South Africa. But this highly evolved defensive ability of the snake specifically is what makes it so unique. And if it is able to blind anything that's potentially attacking it, that of course gives it the chance to quickly make an escape. Look at the precision. All I need to do is move very slowly back and forth and that snake does not lose its focus on where my hand is at and specifically where my eyes are located. Let's go for one more even closer. Yeah, it's about as close as you probably want to get to spinning cobra right there. <sighs> Every single time, it makes you jolt, even though I feel completely protected behind this shield. It never gets any less nerve-wracking to be that close. Now, one of the things that's the most interesting about the fang design of 
this cobra species is that it has evolved over millions of years and they have fixed front fangs and in most instances where there's a little hole in the tip of the fang this has a modified fang where the hole is actually in the front and it is specialized muscles inside of the skull that allow it to spit the closer i get imagine if i was a leopard out there in the jungle and i approached this snake and with a paw reached out to touch that tail you get that reaction Ooh, and there you have it, a full face full of very painful venom. Now that venom is not used in any instance for the snake to catch and kill its prey. It's only a defense mechanism, but the venom that comes from the bite specifically has neurotoxic and cytotoxic properties. This is an incredibly potent bite. And if I was bitten, it would be an immediate medical emergency and anti-venom would definitely need to be administered if we were to save my life. But the spitting aspects, like you saw just there, will not kill you if it just gets ah, into your eye. Wow, that was two double squirts right in a row. Whew. Doesn't get much crazier than that. Oh, one of the coolest and most famous influences in relation to the spitting cobra is of course the Dilophosaurus from Jurassic Park. And the filmmakers took the influence of this animal's ability to design the Dilophosaurus, not only in the neck frills, but also in that ability to spit venom. And right now I definitely feel like Dennis Nedry, oh, when it comes to getting shot in the face with toxic venom. You can see the snake is just completely locked in at the moment. And that accuracy is impressive. Venomous snakes don't want to use their toxic powers on humans. But if you make the foolish choice to harass or interact with them, the consequences can easily put you in the hospital, or in a worst case result, six feet underground. So at this point, we are going to get the shield off of me because I certainly don't want to keep walking around with all the ability to accidentally wipe my fingers on that, get anything in my eyes, or in a worst case scenario, somehow get it on Trent. You guys, you have to understand, I've never seen Trent as nervous as I was when that cobra got spit all over his camera. And I don't know if that's because Trent is afraid for his own well-being or the camera's well-being, but safety first, so we gotta make sure that we get everything cleaned up as best we possibly can. You know what I'm going to say next, but just in case you didn't pay close attention to our 25 previous snake episodes, always admire these slithering reptiles from a respectful distance. Okay, it's a beautiful night in Costa Rica, and I'm sitting next to one of the most iconic snake species in this country. That is an eyelash viper. Now we've worked with this species in the past. In fact, I found the yellow phase of this snake out in the wild several years ago. But this one here is actually an ambassador for its species that was born and raised in captivity. This snake specifically is used to help educate people about the snakes that live here in Central America and why you want to safely avoid them at all cost. Now this snake is not necessarily as toxic as something like a fertilance, which makes it the perfect subject matter for tonight. What you see here on the table are a pair of Hex Armor Bite Proof Gloves. Supposedly, these can withstand the bite of a venomous snake. Now obviously I wouldn't try this with something as large as like a Western Diamondback, an Eastern Diamondback, or a fertilance, but the eyelash viper has smaller fangs and I feel a little bit safer free handling that snake with these gloves. We'll get to that risky entertainment in just a few moments. But first what I wanna do is take an educational look at this incredible reptile. Now the eyelash viper is an arboreal species, which means they're primarily found up in trees. And as you see the snake right here, gently clutched on this branch, it almost looks as if it's a gargoyle, staying completely still. And this is usually exactly how you will see these snakes out in the wild, waiting in ambush. They are ambush predators, and all they need to do is hang from a tree branch and wait for something to come close. They primarily feast upon animals that are gonna be up in the treetops. Lizards, frogs, bats, even birds fall victim to snakes like this. And you see that position the snake's in right now? That S-curled shape? head pointing down, something gets close, it strikes out and with those hinged fangs injects a hematoxic venom. Now what's unique about the eyelash vipers as compared to many other pit viper species is that when they bite, they actually lock on. When you think of something like a fertilance, it's gonna strike out, inflict a bite, let go, and then track its prey once it has succumbed to the venom. 
But with a snake like this that lives up in the trees, it needs to bite and hold on. If this guy bites a bat and that bat falls out of the tree, the snake's gotta go all the way down to the ground to get it. So this snake wants to bite, hold on, and then it's got its chance for a meal. Uh, the name eyelash viper, where does that name come from? If you take a real close look at the face of this snake, you'll see two little modified scales growing just above the eyes. Sort of makes it look like horns, or in this case, a pair of eyelashes. Now scientists believe that these modified scales perhaps help them navigate through the arboreal environment, maybe pushing away plant matter or possibly to help keep them camouflaged. These snakes are incredibly good at keeping themselves hidden within the environment. Now, if you're to go out into the Costa Rican rainforest at night, the thing that's actually dangerous is that if somebody grabs onto a branch, let's say you're moving through the environment, you grip onto something, helping yourself navigate. If one of these snakes is in the tree, that's how you're accidentally bitten. These snakes are not necessarily going to ever be aggressive towards humans unless threatened. However, if you were to unfortunately be bitten, it is a hemotoxic venom, and that means medical emergency. Now, you guys clicked on this video because the thumbnail likely has this snake close to my hand. It's like, oh my gosh, is Coyote going to get bitten by a venomous snake tonight? I'm not attempting to provoke a bite from this snake. The reason that I'm going to try to handle this snake with bite-proof gloves is because it's a fragile species, right? A snake of this size is rather delicate. It's not something that you want to squeeze and hold on to. You don't want to pin its head. You don't want to have complete control of the snake. The idea is that if I can hold it gently with these gloves, it may be a tactic that we use in the future to handle small venomous snakes. Coral snakes, sidewinders, eyelash vipers, these are perfect subject matters for using these bite-proof gloves. I also have to be aware of how close this snake gets to my face. So keeping it out in front of me like this is extremely important. Remember, they've got a rather far reach and a snake like this can lunge forward nearly two thirds the length of its body. If I'm bitten in the face by a snake like this, it's going to be a very bad end to my day. Whew. It takes a little bit of nerves when you start thinking about handling a venomous snake. And while in the past I've interacted with many different venomous species, to actually be hands on with one without controlling its head is something that I have not attempted before. So if you're ready, it's time to free handle the eyelash viper. What I'm hoping is that I will be able to get it to just kind of come right out onto my hand. So you see that? The snake is backing its head up ever so slightly. Now that position right there, definitely could warrant a bite. But you'll notice the snake is not aggressive in any way whatsoever. It's sensing my hand, now I see the tongue flicking out, it's investigating me saying, okay, this is something new in my environment, but it doesn't look like something that I would necessarily want to eat. So I'm going to gently see if I can bring it up. Oh, there we go. Let's see if I can get you to come out here onto my hand. There we go. There we go. Okay, this is going really well so far. Really, really well. There we go. And I just want to make sure that I'm not constraining the snake too, too much. There we go. Oh, I'm going to keep you right there. That's perfect. I'm very happy about that position. Now, if I just keep my hand like this, you see how it's causing the snake to balance itself into a curled position. That is absolutely perfect. Now, on camera, it's tough to tell exactly how close that snake is to my face. It probably looks closer than it really is, so I don't want any of you to think, Coyote, you've got that pit viper way too close to you. Trust me, guys, it would take a huge jump for it to be able to leap out and get me in the face at this point. It's also why I'm keeping my hand slightly here blocked, just in case something crazy happens. But if I turn it like this, you can really get a great look at that snake's profile. They are just so incredibly beautiful. And like all pit vipers, they have a heat-seeking pit, and this snake is capable of sensing all sorts of different heat registers. So if this snake spots something like a lizard, this snake is using its incredible eyesight to be able to identify animals that do not have warm blood. Notice the vertical pupil. That expands and contracts based on the amount of light in the environment, which helps them to see incredibly well at night. And for anybody that's afraid of snakes, the fear, which is called ophidiophobia, you can see that this is not something that is aggressive toward humans. You may be saying to yourselves, well, Coyote, you said that this snake was born and raised in captivity. Doesn't make a difference, guys. It's behaving the exact same way that one of these snakes would in the wild. If you're not swinging your hand in front of it, if you're not poking at it with a stick, if you're simply admiring it from a safe distance, it will be a great experience. 
That's probably also a great spot for me to give you guys that stereotypical warning where I say never go out into the environment and try to handle a snake. Now the people that use these Hex Armor gloves are typically professionals. Anything could happen here. I could be bitten. While I do trust the gloves, I would never want you guys to be in a position where you could accidentally receive a bite from a snake like this. Now, like I said earlier, the reason that I'm using these bite-proof gloves tonight is to test out whether or not free handling smaller venomous snakes like this is a good tactic for us moving forward. So if I were to physically grab onto the snake or pin its head down with a snake hook or hold it with snake tongs, it puts a lot of stress on the animal. You can see how calm it's being right now. And this is an awesome way for us to be able to get these animals up close for the cameras without putting a lot of stress on them. I'm gonna try a little experiment here. What I'm gonna do is slowly move my hand in towards the snake's nose. Not to necessarily provoke a strike, but let's just see what the aggression level is as I move my hand in toward its face. Very slowly. Look at that. Snake just basically stays in gargoyle mode. Yep, I bopped you on the nose just a tiny bit there. You can see it's kind of curled its head back in a little bit of a strike pose, saying okay. You got close, let's not push it too much further than that, and I won't, but that's exactly what I wanted to try to determine. Is this snake feeling completely calm because it's not restrained? It has no reason to strike out and try to bite me. Wow, well, what a cool experiment this was tonight. Determining that using bite-proof gloves is a great way to interact with smaller venomous snakes. It's allowed me to stay calm, the snake has stayed calm, and we've gotten a really cool Central American species up close for the cameras. The one and only Eyelash Viper. All right, I'm gonna place you back up on your tree branch. Sound good? It is early morning, and it is very similar to the conditions we had the other day when we visited this mechanic's property and unfortunately came across a dead black mamba. We've gotten a call, he has seen another mamba. So we are in fast pursuit to get out to this property as fast as we can so that the snake doesn't either A, kill another dog or get killed itself. Black mambas get a bad reputation as a snake species that will actually chase after you. That is never going to be the case with any animal. They're always gonna choose flight before fight. But most importantly, we need to keep ourselves safe because a bite from one of these animals is a medical emergency. Nothing comes close to the black mamba, just due to its size and just the immense speed of these snakes. So yeah, we're going to try to avoid as much as possible having this human mamba conflict, especially with the guys, dogs and cats. So we're going to try to get rid of this mamba and relocate it. So right now Tyrone is just flipping every piece of flat material that he can find anywhere this time of day that would be perfect for snakes to be hiding. Creepy abandoned building. Nest full of wasps. We're gonna keep moving. This is probably a needle in a haystack. Look at this. Especially a snake that's grayish, black in color. Talk about crazy camo. If there was a mamba in here, we'll get on in there. Let's find that snake. Well, we've been searching for about 25 minutes now. I've not seen any snakes. I've seen a lot of other things. And it's usually when you're looking for a snake that you don't find a snake. They always surprise you. Ooh, that is creepy. Oh, it's like a rodent super highway back there. I don't know if you can see that. We got a snake. A snake? Where? Yeah, we got a snake. Is it a mamba? It's a mamba. We got a black mamba. He's just under this little piece of tile. Snake! Hey, there's a yellow snake. What? There's a yellow snake. Hey! You got a snake? Is it the mamba? I think it's the mamba, man. Really, really, really? Where? Oh, man, in here? You saw it? Yeah, he's under there. He's a, he looks like a pretty big mamba. It is a mamba. It's definitely a mamba. Shoot, I hope there's no hole back there. I don't see anything. Yes, I do. I see a snake. Definitely see a snake back there. Oh, yes. Yeah. Dude, I think it's a mamba. Inspiration, we coloration. All right, um, mamba madness at its finest right here. That's a mamba. That is definitely a mamba. Tyrone, what is the play? Cool, so we're gonna just move some of the stuff that's sitting on top here. I'm gonna get a tongue on the snake. We're gonna get sort of about 50, 60 centimeters behind the head. 
and then we're going to try to get another tongue on the snake just to secure it so the snake starts wriggling around, doesn't put any of us in danger. Okay. Yeah, so we're just going to safely secure the snake and we're going to go from there. We're just going to have to be really agile. These snakes are really unpredictable, um, super defensive, so we just got to be on high alert because this is top tier, the most dangerous snake in the country here. Okay, this is the worst case scenario because it's pinned into a corner. Yeah. The safest scenario for myself, the crew, and certainly the snake is going to be to get it inside one of these tubes so we have control of the head. All right, I'm, I'm here on your command, so you let me know what you need me to do. Cool, so we're just going to get on right to it. Now we're going to move some of this shrapnel out the way. Yeah, you can see the big coil of the snakes right coming out the back there. We've got a big, big mamba. Oh, man, yeah. Cool, we're going in hot. You want to lift it? Lift yeah, it. Lift it. Yeah, we got a black mamba. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm going to grab it. Tongs on the snake. You can see he's puffing up his neck there slightly. It's a little narrow hood. One tongue is secure. We're going to grab the secondary part of the snake here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Cool, the snake is secure. I'm coming out in the open area here. Wow. That's, cool. That is a big snake. Okay, so you want me to get the tubes? Yeah, let's get the tubes, Cody. Okay. Uh, what do you think? Largest tube? Yeah, let's get with the largest tube. We're just gently restraining the snake. We don't want to put too much pressure on him. Get his head in there. Okay, he's going, he's going. Let him go, let him go a little bit more. I'm gonna, he's gonna reverse. Okay, oh. do, you want, do you want to grab it? Are you comfortable grabbing that? Just put him all the way up there. Let me know as okay. soon as you're comfortable. Yeah, I got a little, no, I'm not comfortable yet. Yeah, I've still got the tongs on it, they're safe. Okay. I, I want you to just put that back hand, so like completely holding the tube and that snake so he's yep. not gonna reverse, because he is gonna pull back. He is gonna pull back, okay. okay just, you don't think he can get out from there? No, as long as you've got a good grip on him. Tell me when you're comfortable, I'm gonna release the tongs. Okay, go ahead and release the tongs. This is no rocky moment. Yeah, and I just you remember, he, he, is, he may try reverse, so if he does, just hold him quite in place there. Okay. You got him. Okay. Can I work him up a little bit further? Yeah, you can work him up a little cool. further. <sighs> Good work. Oh, my hands are shaking at the moment. Wow, that is a very strong snake. Um, okay, we'll watch your face there, sorry. There we have it. That is a black mamba, safely tubed. Rather intense situation, but that went pretty smoothly. That's how we do it. We work safely. I catch my breath for a minute. My heart is racing. Okay, so the snake is staying pretty calm now. Um, let's go out of this enclosure and get ourselves in a spot that's a little more open. Uh, if for any reason I have to drop the snake and it comes out of the tube, we're in really close quarters. So uh, let's slowly move out. You guys move first. I'm going to take it really, really slow. I got a really good. Good grip. Tyrone, you want to check my grip on the snake? You think that's Yeah, we're good there. And let's solid. just angle a little bit up, just in okay. case he shoots out. You got okay. it. Yeah, you got a good grip. Yeah, and just, you want to sec yeah, secure the tail there, you're good, Code. Yeah. Man, this snake is insanely strong. Whoa! Man, it is intimidating to hold one of these snakes. Right now, just trying to calm my heart rate. There it is, the notorious black mamba. It's almost tough to put into words what it's like to hold on to a black mamba. This is a species that I have just read about for most of my life, always hoping that I would see one in the wild and not actually be hands-on with one, the most dangerous snake species I have ever physically interacted with. It is definitely a heart-racing encounter. Now, the black mamba, of course, gets its name from the black interior coloration of the mouth. And if I turn it like this and it opens up its mouth, we'll be able to get a really cool shot of that. The reason a bite from this snake is so potentially dangerous is because it is armed with a highly toxic, neurotoxic venom. If you're bitten by this snake, it begins to send your body into paralysis, which shuts down your major organs. So when your lungs, uh, your liver, your kidneys, and ultimately your heart begin to cease working, that's why a bite is so dangerous. Essentially, you just straight up go into paralysis and die. If you were ever bitten by a snake like this, it is an immediate medical emergency. The big issue that we're looking at here today is the human-wildlife conflict. And people are terrified of the black mamba. Obviously, it has a negative reputation, but this is not a snake that is interested in interacting with humans. A dog was bitten. Unfortunately, that dog passed away, and the snake was killed in the process. You have that constantly happening out here, especially in rural areas. But these snakes are not to blame. We are in an area that is 
perfectly set up for snakes to be hunting for their food. You've got abandoned structures, you've got bags of garbage that has everything that would draw in rodents. Where you have rodents, you're going to have the reptiles that eat them. So the more you can do in your own yard to clean up the trash and make sure that you're not drawing in the prey items for these snakes, the less of your chance of actually seeing one of these snakes and ultimately interacting with it. So the last aspect to today's snake rescue is to actually relocate this snake to a place that's far away from human habitation. That will give the better chances for this snake to live out the length of its life, and of course will keep the dogs and the humans in this area completely safe. Now, is this a resident mamba that we were told about? It's possible, it is pretty sizable, but when you live in an area like this, there's always going to be another snake. So you can see why the work that Tyrone does is so incredibly important here in South Africa. And a big thanks to him for taking us out on this rescue mission. I feel completely fulfilled in that we have finally found one of these snakes that we were able to rescue. It didn't lose its life, and uh, we're doing a good thing for the environment by getting this predator back out to where it belongs. Okay, we found a pretty cool spot to release the mamba. We are way back off some dirt road, and we have found a beautiful dry riverbed. It is just perfect mamba habitat. Grasses, trees, likely a lot of food. So uh, we're gonna get the snake out, and this is another success story for Tyrone in successfully rescuing and relocating a venomous snake. The hills of West Virginia hide within their peaks and valleys, a plethora of animal species. In fact, this wild and wonderful state is one of the most biodiverse regions in the eastern U.S. On this adventure, I will be teaming up with my longtime friend and field herpetologist, Tim Brust. Tim is a backwoods bloodhound when it comes to tracking down reptiles and amphibians. The last time we worked together, he helped us find the elusive hellbender, one of the nation's most cherished salamander species. We got him! Woo! There it is! It is an absolute giant! That was the hardest hellbender catch I've ever had. Wow! Oh, man. Today we are hot on the trail of the timber rattlesnake. Hailing as one of the largest venomous snakes in North America, these pit vipers are masters of camouflage so finding one hidden amongst the rocky crevices and outcrops will be an arduous challenge. There's a tree down in the middle of the road that I'm gonna help Tim move. The task required us to travel deep into West Virginia's wilderness as we pushed our vehicle to its safest limits. <laughs> oh no! All right, we may not be going any further than this. Literally just got done talking about how we got past the toughest area of rocky terrain and we have now turned the corner. Are you kidding me? Oh, I think we're gonna be able to get past this, but it's the next bend that looks even more difficult. Look at that total rock slide that came down off the mountain and to this. So the Jeep should be able to get over this, no problem. It's just a matter of what is up and around the corner. How far off are we from the coordinates? couple hours at least. Okay, so we have made a decision at this point. We were thinking about going over the mountain and up that rock slide right there. Way too treacherous with cameras. So what we're gonna do now is go on foot down the roadway and it is roughly two miles as the crow flies to get to these spots that Tim has GPS coordinated where snakes have been seen. For us, it's gonna be more than two miles. It's gonna be probably close to a four or five hour hike to get to the spot. So it is going on 11 o'clock now. With any luck, what's gonna happen is we are gonna reach the snake spot when they're doing their second basking for the day, which will be somewhere between four and six o'clock PM. It's gonna be a commitment, but this is what it takes to find the timber rattlesnake. All right, well, we found potentially the location based on Tim's phone. And he thinks maybe 300 yards down this little kind of valley is the spot. We're gonna scout it. With any luck, we're gonna actually see the location. We just need to really know an entry point. The foliage is all so dense, whether it's trees or these scrublands and grasses, unless you can see exactly where to go down it, you could just be descending into a ravine. So scouting with the drone is definitely giving us a bird's eye perspective of the terrain before we even embark upon heading down into it. I think this is it. This is all on that slope. What are you seeing? 
Oh, see that? That is all rock right there. Open, rocky. Yes. I'll crop. Can you get lower to see the size of those rocks then? Yeah, I'm just gonna, just gonna try to. Oh yeah, man, that's gotta be it. Look at that, that's all rocky terrain. I think we found it. We found a spot and I think Tim found a spot. Okay. He's been yelling at us, so I don't know what that means. I can't really hear him. Maybe he has a snake? Maybe he's got a snake. Okay, well, let's pack up the drone. This is great. We have spent hours searching out rocky outcrops, and now we possibly have two potentials. One we saw on the drone, and one that Tim is calling us to come towards. Tim, did you get one? Wow. This is it right here. Perfect timber rattlesnake habitat. Now it's just a matter of searching and finding. What do you think, Mario? Do you see how unique this habitat is? It's overgrown with some vegetation, but it also still allows for some exposed rocks so they can come out and bask. It's kind of the best of both worlds. Okay, so basically you need to spend some time searching these rocks for snakes. It's a nice den here. Any one of these big rocks that has almost a miniaturized cave underneath it is exactly the kind of spot that we want to be looking. Now the best spots are going to be rocks exposed to the sun, part sun, part shade, so that when the sun comes out, the snake can come and warm itself up. And then when it gets too hot, he can go hunker back down in the shade. Oh, nice. What you got? You got a little fence lizard. What's really cool about these guys is the males. Oh. <laughs> Don't fall off the cliff. Don't lose the lizard. Don't fall off the cliff. What's cool about these fence lizards is they look kind of drab and they're dorsal, but on their ventrals, look at that, really beautiful. That's a nice blue, awesome. These guys are really fast moving. I'm surprised I actually caught them. Beautiful little specimen. I'm gonna put them down, watch them take off. There he goes. All right, let's try to catch a rattlesnake. All right, we are in the rattlesnake spot now, but What's a little more eerie is that I think we are also in the den of a bear or maybe fox. There are bones, chunks of meat, and also some vomit, like vomited flesh. And back within here are a bunch of small pathways. And it's an area like this over here where you're usually the most nervous. You don't wanna just stumble upon something that is hiding in the underbrush. Okay, I'm gonna head back over where Tim and Mario were, and we're going to keep looking for rattlesnakes. But I don't think it gets much more dangerous than this. Rattlesnakes and a potential bear den. Okay, we are on the side of a mountain in the middle of nowhere, West Virginia right now. We have descended, I'd say close to 800, maybe a thousand feet. And it's impossible to tell on the GoPro, but if you look out through there, you can see the open expanse of wilderness. It is beautiful, but the terrain is extremely difficult. When you look up back behind me, you can see all this rocky terrain that we have come down through. We've gotten to the point now where we've been out here for so many hours, we're thinking we need to turn back because if we don't, we may not get to the vehicle, which then has to drive all the way down the mountain back to civilization uh, before the sun sets. Uh, there's always the chance of finding a snake on the way back up, but at this point, we may have reached the juncture of failure. No rattlesnakes on our rattlesnake expedition, which is discouraging, but it still has been a really fun time out here exploring the backcountry of West Virginia. It's not often that a target species manages to elude us. Yet after many hours of searching, we still hadn't seen a single rattlesnake. Then on our way back to the Jeep, we came upon a slithering surprise that we didn't expect. Tim just called out that he found a copperhead. No rattlesnakes yet, but this is a great opportunity. Did it go under? Yeah, I think I can lift it though. Okay. Grab it quick. All right, bag, bag, bag. All right, we got a copperhead. Definitely cannot 
work with or present this snake on the side of this hill though. So let's take it up here and get a closer look. Okay. Ah, this is better. Now we can actually stand. Okay, let's find a good open flat spot here right behind you with this rock. I'm gonna just gently fold the edges down and let it slither out a bit on its own. There we go. Everybody just be on high alert. Snake is coming oh, yeah. out. There he is. Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Copperheads do have a tendency to be rather spastic. Very quick snake. Yeah, let me just kind of balance it up on the snake hook like this. Ooh, struck at your camera there. Look at that defensive pose. That is strike mode at its finest right there. These are very fast striking snakes. It's definitely a species you always want to be cognizant of when you're in the environment. They are so perfectly camouflaged. Now to really get a better look at this snake, there's a method that we can use to actually handle it called tubing, where the front of the snake will go inside of a plastic tube and that will allow me to handle the snake without the risk of being bitten. And a copperhead's staying rather calm right now, which is great, it's exactly what we want. Look at that. Now it's really important that I keep one hand on the snake and the tube at the exact same time. What we don't want to happen is for the copperhead to wiggle out backwards and inflict a bite. That is so cool, what a beautiful reptile. Now, while the copperhead is a pit viper, it is not a rattlesnake. However, like rattlesnakes, they will sometimes wiggle just the tip of their tail against leaf litter, alerting any potential predator or even a human that, hey, if I've been spotted, I'm here in the environment and you don't want to get any closer. Now, people oftentimes confuse non-venomous snake species with copperheads or water moccasins. And you can see that very distinct banding that runs down the length of the body. It looks just like the banding on a younger northern water snake. And even the underside, the underbelly, that slight checkered patterning and the design on the dorsal scale pattern almost looks like a fox snake, another completely harmless species. So this snake does have a rather negative reputation, but as long as you don't try to interact with the snake in the environment, all it wants to do is stay completely hidden from humans. Now, when it comes to venom toxicity, this is a dangerous snake. It is not a reptile you would ever want to be bitten by. But when it comes to the venomous snakes in the United States, this is on the lower end of potency, right? So a water moccasin, which is a much larger snake, is gonna have a higher venom yield when it bites you, especially when it comes to rattlesnakes. An eastern diamondback, a timber rattlesnake, a western diamondback, bigger snake means a larger venom yield. You can see the size of this snake's head is rather small, which means it has smaller venom glands. But keep in mind, it's all about how your body reacts to venom. Just recently, somebody in Alabama was bitten by a copperhead and they died from anaphylactic shock. A bite from a snake like a copperhead could mean the end of your life. Well, we didn't manage to find our target, the timber rattlesnake, but that's okay. We still came across one of West Virginia's most iconic pit vipers, the copperhead. And getting it up close, testing out this method of tubing, totally made the adventure worthwhile. Now before we release it right back where we found it, what I actually wanna do is place it in the leaf litter to show you just how camouflaged this snake truly is. Most people do their best to avoid interactions with snakes. A smart state of mind, especially if the species is venomous. Suffice it to say, snakes think exactly the same and do their absolute best to avoid humans. If you find yourself exploring in an area that is known to inhabit venomous snakes, your safest plan of action is to wear sturdy hiking boots, stick to well-worn trails, and most importantly, pay attention to where you are walking, and you should be completely safe. Okay, we're gonna let the copperhead slither right back out of the snake bag. Perfect. Look at that. In the world of Pokemon, the tagline is you gotta catch them all. Today we're in Australia, and we're going to put Mario up to the ultimate Pokemon challenge. See if he can catch a frill dragon in real life. This iconic reptile is the inspiration for the Pokemon character known as the Heliolisk. So while Mario's trying to catch the real life version, I'm gonna be opening up several packs to see whether or not I can pull the card before he can catch the lizard. Stay tuned, because we're gonna find out who can win the ultimate Pokemon challenge. Okay. Found a nice picnic table. Seems like the right spot to set up and start my opening of Pokemon cards. <sighs> Got my backpack full of goodies right here. 
I'm gonna be setting up multiple cameras today. There it is. The Elite Trainer box of Crown Zenith Pokemon cards. That Helolisk might be in there somewhere. I've got two boxes, so I like my chances. I also have my little tiny frill dragon that I brought with me for good luck. I actually also have walkie talkie. Let's check in with Mario. Check, check, coyote to Mario. Just making sure the walkies work. I read you. How's it going? Well, I found a nice picnic table. I'm set up in the shade. I got my boxes of Crown Zenith ready to go. And uh, I'm about to start popping some packs. See any lizards yet? Uh, well, we're struggling a bit right now. Uh, not seeing much, but uh, we're gonna continue searching. Okay, well, good luck out there. Uh, I'm gonna start opening some packs. See ya. Okay, bye. <laughs> struggling already. I think I've got this thing in the can. The tactic to search for frill lizards it's kind of straightforward. Good binoculars, you're gonna look at all the trees and try to find them vertically hanging and sticking their heads out. It's very distinct. Once we do find a frill lizard, Lockie and I are gonna to have to coordinate so that I could catch the lizard without it actually seeing me coming. That's the tough part. I'm pretty confident that I'm gonna catch a frill lizard, whether I'm gonna catch it before Coyote finds the Pokemon card. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but I know if we see a lizard, and it is within my range of catching. I'm gonna catch it. Oh, 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 come here. I think I've got something really cool. Take these. Yep. All right, see this tree right in front of us here? Yep. Look to the right of it, you see the thin tree. Yes. The sapling. Okay, yep, hang on. If it is what I think it is, this is gonna be really, oh, really cool. Is that a baby frilly? It's a baby frilly. <laughs> okay, so. We never had any uh, stipulations about what size frilly we were gonna catch, right? I didn't hear anything about size in the rules. Oh my Usually gosh. Usually the hatchlings stick to these saplings because the larger frillies don't use them as much. But that's a frilly. Okay, here we go. <laughs> let's do it. All right. Let's go, let's go. You'll see where the first uh, branch starts to branch off on the left-hand side. He is just below that on the back-hand side. <laughs> he got him. He got him. Look at that. <laughs> That's a baby frilly. Is it a frilly? It's a frilly. Oh my gosh, he's tiny. Oh, wow. Look at that. Wow. Okay, this counts, right? That's a frilly. It's a frilly. All I heard in the rules is if you catch a frilly first, you win. Hey, Coyote, come in. Go for Coyote. Quick question for you. Um, is there a baby form of the helio, what, what's it called, a uh, heliolips? Is there like a baby form of that? A baby heliolisk? Helioptile. Let's just say that I think I got uh, a helio reptile. You have a baby frill dragon. That's 10 4. Oh, uh, helioptile, dude, that is awesome. So, for context, I have not even opened up a pack of cards yet, and you've already technically found a frill dragon, but if I pull the Helioptile card, I think it kind of cancels out you catching a baby frill dragon. Okay, well, I guess the search continues for both of us. Game on. <laughs> How about that? He has already caught a baby frill dragon. Right after he tells me he's struggling, radio's back, and he's got a baby one. Honestly, this is... This is super cute and kind of unique, right? I mean, Very unique. I've, I've caught a lot of adults, but I've never caught one that young. Yeah. You can generally tell how young they are just because they don't have the vibrant colors of an adult. Uh, camouflage is the number one tactic for these guys. And you can also see he's re relying on that now rather than putting the frill out. If it yes. was an adult, he'd be, you know, getting pretty defensive by now. But this guy, he's just happy to uh, stay as still as possible and yeah. hope that you're just going to let him go when you're done with him. Look at that. He thinks my finger is a, a little branch. I personally think this is super Super unique just because most people will never encounter a hatchling and there's really no need to mess around with him because he's just he's just hanging out but that is as as adorable as it gets for a reptile next step is to release this hatchling and search for an adult yep let's do it ah <sighs> okay I think I'm ready to open up some packs here I'm excited all right let's see this one Seems like a good place to start. Will there be a Heliolisk 
inside this pack. How crazy would it be if first pack, first card was Heliolisk? First card, Eggs Acute, not Heliolisk, whatever this guy is. Cherry Ub, ooh, Young Goose, that's cool. It's like a mongoose. Ooh, I got the Pokeball. All right, that's pretty good. Well, I would say that will help me catch them all. Scyther, looks like some sort of a dragon mixed with a praying mantis. Ooh, look at this one. Palkia, and it's kind of golden hologram. I wonder if that is special. V-Star Power Star Portal, 280 HP. Not sure what that means, but some of you Pokemon fans might be excited about that. Lost Vacuum. Ooh, it looks like a Dust Buster. Electric, that's like an electric eel. Got the Ultra Ball there. All right, on to the next pack, here we go. Okay, we spotted it for a lizard. Now the hard part is to actually sneak up on it and catch it. Locky, come in. Yeah, I gotcha. I'm just actually starting to see some movement from him now. He's starting to do a little bit of a head bob, so possibility that he actually sees another dragon nearby. Is it the tree that's directly in front of me? That's correct, yep, the one closest to you. No. <laughs> the tree was very slippery. The lizard was onto us and it started to get higher and higher up. So I thought I was gonna be able to do some crazy parkour thing and just jump up the tree. But as soon as I touched the tree, it was super slippery and I couldn't get enough grip to go higher up. So there was a 5% chance that I would have grabbed that branch, overhanging branch, hauled myself up, gripped the tree and grabbed the lizard. Maybe a 1% chance. <laughs> I'd say closer to one. Yeah. <laughs> Worth a try. All right, uh, we're gonna go in from here. Write in the comments section below and tell us which is your favorite Pokemon. Give us some suggestions of other animals that represent animals within the Pokemon universe and maybe we'll make another episode like this where we go out, send Mario on the mission to catch the animal and I'll open up the packs to see if I can pull it right out of a sheet. All right, we got a Shinx. Oh, Wooloo! Oh, hot diggity dog, ladies and gentlemen. Look what we have here. There it is, the Helioptile. Coyote to Mario. Come in, Mario. Go for Mario. You're not gonna believe what I just pulled. I've got the baby Heliolisk. Awesome. So. I guess we're kind of tied, right? I got a baby Frilly and you got that Helioptot. Yes, your baby dragon, while I'm sure it was awesome, I just canceled out with this little baby. Okay, the next potential catch or card might win the challenge. Well, may the best lizard champion win. I got more packs and you don't have that dragon yet. So I'm getting back to it. This is officially going in a sleeve. I am really excited about this. <laughs> I was honestly getting a little nervous because if Mario only catches the baby dragon and I did not get a Heliolisk, he would have won. But now, we've officially got a tie. All right, going at the top tier of my cards that I've opened so far, and we're moving on. The sun's not even completely out. Oh, it's gotta be high 80s, like into maybe 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It's... You're going to need to run for it. Where's he at? You're not going to be able to see him now. So you see this tree straight through here, yes. light colored, yay yes. brown. He's on that back fork. He's probably as high as you can reach. I'd say just jump as high as you can reach and reach around to the back and hopefully you get a tail. All right, here you go. Go. I got him! I got him! <laughs> we got one! We got a big one! He was a runner! <laughs> okay, this is significantly bigger than the little one. And you can see, there it goes. <laughs> There's only one way to show you this unique display. That's to actually get one in hand. I mean, this is like straight out of science fiction. It's ridiculous. It's like this lizard goes from being super slim to really big, and that's intimidating. If you are a predator and like you don't know that this lizard does that, you're gonna catch it, it's gonna hood up, frill out, and you're probably gonna leave it alone. 
not only do they hood up, but they gape with their mouths open. And then when they hit the ground, they go bipedal. They actually run on two feet. And when I was chasing this one, it got up on its two feet, climbed the tree nearest point of safety. And I barely got him, barely got him. Oh, Mario, I got another one. You got another one? Got another one. <laughs> he's, he's even bigger than that one. On the back of this tree, his head's just poking oh around. Oh my gosh. I'll, I'll hold that, give me that one. Okay, here you go. This whole time, he's right there. That's he's a big one. He's definitely bigger than this one. That's a big boy. You can see how wide his head is. Two frillies, better than one. All right, let's go. I've lost sight of him. You're gonna have to go for a blind grab. <laughs> That's a big one. Oh my gosh. That's as big as it gets. It's enormous. Look at the size difference. Holy smokes. That's a dinosaur. Uh, I've got a female here and yours is a big male. And you can see how much more defensive he is as well. Comparatively Dude. to her. She's not too worried anymore at all. She's kind of relaxed. She's got her frill back in, but look at him. <laughs> Dude, this guy is massive. Look at that frill. I mean, that is spectacular. He's really impressive. That's, that's, Im that's as impressive as I get. I think there's only one thing left to do. We got to radio into Coyote. I think so. And tell him we won. All right, you do the honors. Coyote, come in. Coyote here. Um, I think you want to come over to where we're at, cause- uh, We got two, dude. Just, just come on over here, check it out. We got two. <laughs> all right, all right, I'm coming right now. Holy cow, all right, it looks like Mario might have caught two frill dragons. They're on the far side of the park over here. I can actually see them. Oh man, I think Mario's gonna win this contest unless I can open up those last five packs and get a holographic heliolisk. Holy cow, oh my gosh, what? Two frilly. Oh my goodness. Big male. Dude, that is the biggest frill dragon I have ever Scene. He's gorgeous. I thought you guys were kidding. All right, Lockie, I'm gonna trade. <sighs> Get out of town. All right, so I'm assuming probably female here. And that's the big boy. Wait, where, where did you guys get these? Tree just down there. The female actually was a very thin, small tree. Jumped okay. off, I had to chase it down. And this big boy was right here in this tree. This is probably his female, so this is probably like the dominant male in this area. I'm, I'm borderline speechless, so I've opened up lots of packs of cards so far. Okay. Don't have the healer list yet, but look at how much this animal would have influenced that Pokemon creature. Yes. Even the spikes along the side of the frill look like the frill on the healer list. When you hold the two of them side by side, you see quite a bit of difference between the male and the female. The female's so much smaller, darker in coloration, that male's got those bright orange display colors and look at those front canine teeth. Oh. If the camera could see my wrist right now and all the scratches, those claws are no joke. They need those claws to grip the trees. That's why they could just scale up the trees so fast. The skin, when you describe the skin, the texture is like sandpaper. I mean, the design on the side of this thing is so prehistoric looking. It's fantastic. It's and just crazy. The frill is very, smooth, I would say kind of like like leatherish almost, but they are scales. Uh, there are some rods of cartilage that actually extend it out. I think you gotta also check out the back of the frill. So right now, as it's frilled and looking at the camera, I could see these two bulges of muscles. Check that out. You see that? That's like its muscles to, I think maybe expand the frill, but it's quite impressive. If this lizard were to grab a hold of you, it would hurt. Those teeth are sharp. They're designed to just crunch up insects. That's their primary diet. They're insectivores. They'll be climbing up on the trees, perched, looking at their surroundings. If something's on the ground, they're gonna jump down, snatch it up, go back up the tree. I set the challenge for you to go out and see whether or not you could actually catch the real life Pokemon character. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, you did it. A juvenile, a female, and a male. Yeah, you know what they say. You gotta catch them all. That's
That's true. Well, I'd say you definitely won this challenge. Now, I do still have five packs of cards left, so I could get the Heliolisk. But in the meantime, we're going to release these lizards back into their respective trees. And by the way, I got a prize for you since you won the contest. All right, cool. Yeah, cool. stay tuned. Got some good stuff coming. I'm Coyote Peterson. I'm Ariel Dakoa. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right, lizards, back to the trees with you. That's how you catch uh, three field dragons in one day. Peace. Welcome to Pokemon Live. Now you've got Mario, the ultimate lizard catcher himself. Oh man. So this is kind of the aftermath of the episode. We got five packs of Pokemon cards left, but first, Mario, I have a prize for you. The Pokemon Gotta Catch Em All t-shirt. Uh, I don't think that there's any way I'm going to win the challenge at this point, so I'm just gonna go ahead and say the t-shirt is yours. Hold it up for everybody, let's take a little look. Oh, it's got the Pikachu on it. Pikachu, pinkish, retro style, cool. That's what I'm talking about. All right, you gotta show me this uh, Helio Reptile thing. Now the Helio list could be in there. Since you've got such a hot hand at the moment, why don't you pick the next pack that I should open? Yeah, that's that's the one right there. We're gonna hold that till the end, okay. and if I don't get the Heliolisk out of these four packs, you're gonna open up that, and if you pull the Heliolisk, dude, we're gonna go crazy. All right, here we go. We've got five packs left. Um, ooh, I haven't seen this one yet, I don't think. Ball toy. That one's kind of cool. All right. Tangela. Ooh, Larvesta. That's kind of neat. Snow Runt. Cute. Switch, not to be confused with Nintendo Whoa, Switch. Whoa, what's that card? Whoa, I don't know. Crazy looking though, wow. Dude, you got like two. Dude, th these might be two of the craziest cards I've gotten. Whoa. A Zoro Arc, 270 HP. Look at that thing. Dang. Holographic and the uh, Simiseer. Also very cool. Fireball Fever, that's what I'm talking about. Wow, okay, put those up there in the, in the, top, in the top lineup. Got an energy card for leaves. Carvine plant. Ooh, friends in Hishu. Hisui. Friends in Hisui. I've not gotten that card yet. That's kind of cool. Uh, this little guy, Shaman. And of course, another advertisement. Wow. Okay. Well, th those were some pretty good cards right there. I have a feeling that those shiny ones are pretty special and pretty powerful. All right. I'm getting a little nervous. Is the Heliolisk going to be in here? We're down to our last four packs, ladies and gentlemen. We got Mr. Mime, probably one of your favorites. Kind of looks like you. Uh, we got Shinx. We got Cricketot. We've got another Pinard. Sure. Sure. Uh, Yanma. Ooh, we got the little cherry guy. Whoa, what's oh, guy? this one's sweet. Eevee. I think this is a really popular one. Eevee. Holographic. 200 HP. That is a sweet card. I have to admit, these uh, illustrations are really neat. Yeah. Rescue Carrier, Pinchurin, Giraffe Rig, and Advertisement. I mean, I know this, this is pretty hard work, what you're doing. Yeah, it's tough. Cards. Have you gotten any paper cuts or anything like that? Uh, no, but my, the, the tips of my fingers are getting a little bit tired. Yeah. It's really from opening the packs. Requires effort. It's, it's, yeah, you yeah. got to have the right technique. I got tore up by that freely. Ooh, yeah, you did. You got a lot of cuts. Don't get any blood on my cards, bro. All right, here we go. Just a few packs left. Okay, I don't think I've seen this one yet. Aaron. Potion Seal. Look at that. Ooh, I got another Oddish. Labaresta. Whoa, look at that. Adamant holographic card supporter. Sure. Oh, whoa, look at this. It's a whale. Wow, a lord. That's cool. So That's going in my favorites pile. Basically, Pokemon, they just like, they look at real animals and then they like put them together and make different weird stuff. Yes, they do. Oh man, this is this is crazy. We're getting down to the last two packs. Come on, Heliolisk, you have to be in here. All right, got a little love disc here. Everybody loves the love disc. And then it's an emotional draw, 70 HP. Execute, we've seen this one. Switch, we've seen this one. Starly, the cute little bird, seen that one. Oh, not looking good here. Cheerium, whoa, that's pretty dope. Metal Blast. I don't know, but that is a gold, shiny, wild card right there. Putting that in the awesome pile. Tauros, that's cool. It's a bull. I have not seen that one before. Definitely putting that in the cool pile. 
Energy Leaf, Salzer, Ultra Bar, Digging Duo. That's us, the Digging Duo. Whoops, the Dynamics Duo. <laughs> All right, it's up to you, man. If the Heliolisk okay. is gonna happen, it's gonna happen in that pack. So you gotta change seats with me so you can put your hands here and go through the cards so that everybody can see you actually opening up the cards. <sighs> this is it, last pack. Is there a Heliolisk in there? Heliolisk must be a lot rarer than we thought. Gotta catch him up. Okay. Okay, we got this dude. Uh-huh. We got this dude. Uh-huh. We got this dude. Shanks. Oh, it's another whale. Whalemer. I like him. <laughs> He's cute. We got this dude. There he is, Whalemer. Oh, man. It's not looking good, guys. Mm-mm. Neoth. Oh, my Ooh. goodness. Pikachu, holographic Pikachu. Pikachu. Dude, that's what, the what coolest I I card. No, no, don't give me. What? Pika Dash. That's a crazy card. That may be the coolest card we've gotten the entire time. Look at this. He's my favorite. It's like a snake constricting some yeah. thingy. Enormous. Okay, we got this. We got oh, this. It's, it's an energy card. <laughs> Friends? I like doing this. I like this. Yeah, I know it's, 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 it's <laughs> no. No. Uh, uh, I won. Me. No, no Heliolisk, but honestly, I am just as excited with the Pikachu. Because if there is one icon that you can pull out of a pack of Pokemon cards, your first Pokemon experience ever, and you pull the Pikachu. I think it goes without saying, Mario has cleaned up and won the ultimate lizard catching championship here in Australia. The frill dragons have been caught. I got some Helioptiles, little That's baby cool ones. Though, yeah. The Heliolisk is still out there, but this was a fantastic time. And write in the comment section below, and like I said, tell us, are there other animals that we should go after? Catch them in the wild, open up the card, see if we can get them. Stay wow. tuned, guys. I think this is a new series on Brave Wilderness. Pretty cool. And that's a wrap. Can I keep this? Uh, no, I get to keep the cards.